know about tomorrow. I just live from day to day. I don't borrow from its sunshine, for its skies may turn to gray. I don't worry o'er the future, for I know what Jesus said. And today I walk beside him, for he knows what is ahead. Many things about tomorrow. Don't seem to understand, but I know who holds tomorrow, and I know who holds my hand. Every step is getting brighter as the goal. Every cloud is silver lined. There the sun is always shining. There no tear will dim the eye. At the ending of a rainbow, where the mountains touch the sky. I don't know about tomorrow. It may bring me poverty, but the one who feeds the sparrow is the one who stands by me. And the have your Bibles, you can join me in Joshua chapter 3, uh, and that's where we've been the last couple weeks as pastors been leading us in a series, Experiencing God, that mirrors a little bit about what they do on Wednesdays in Bible study, Wednesday morning for the women's and uh, group, co-ed group at night. So if you have your Bibles, go to Joshua chapter 3, and we'll be in verses 1 through 17. One of the greatest events happened in my life this past March. It was something I'd been praying for and desiring for a long time. I knew what I wanted in a wife, a partner, and a best friend. And some may be surprised to learn, especially in being here this morning, but I even know, excuse me, knew how I wanted everything to look and go. What I didn't realize was the preparation that went into wedding planning. It's a chore, church. 
throw in my opinions, my high standards, and the fact that my soon-to-be wife lived nine hours away made things even more complicated. On top of it all, I suggested we make this happen in two months so that we can put the money into the wedding instead of traveling back and forth. So that's what we did, and it was crazy. I had no clue what I was getting myself into, but I promised her I'd make sure it was everything she wanted and I'd find the right people who would bring our dreams and aspirations to life. I called people. I met with people. I told people no. I told people yes. And I cried as I wrote people checks. (laughs) All while rejoicing because I was about to marry my sweet Brandy. And this is one of my favorite pictures from the wedding because that was my goal. And then through it all, that was a lot of effort. And my second favorite was just during the ceremony, which we can see here we got tickled. But to be real honest, like that was chaotic. It was nuts. And if I could have had the same results without the preparations, I promise you I would. The prep was horrible. It wasn't fun, but it was also very necessary. Without the preparations, our special day wouldn't have been what it would have hoped for. And I think for many of us here, we want to experience and enjoy different things in life, but we don't want to prepare for those experiences. We want the end results without the work. We want the experiences without all the practice. We want all of the accolades without putting in what's necessary. Students want the good grades without without studying Athletes want to achieve their goals without practice. Younger gen- the younger generation want the high-paying salaries, the accolades, and the promotions without the work ethic. But as we know, that's not possible. Unfortunately, this also happens in our relationship with God as well. We all say we want to experience, we want to experience God, but in reality, if we're honest, we would rather God work in and through us without all the prep. We want the reward. We want the treasures in heaven without the investment of a daily walk with Jesus. Just like I couldn't skip all the prep for our wedding, we can't skip the necessary steps for us as individuals and a church to experience God. To experience God, We need to prepare. We need to get ready. And we can see in the life of Joshua as well, he too wants to experience God and a work of God, but he also, needs the, the, he also understands the need for himself and the people to be prepared. Up to this point, we've seen how God has worked through Moses. And now that he has passed away, God commissions Joshua to lead the people. He reminds Joshua that he had a plan for Israel and that it had not changed. And that the time had come for Israel to get ready to move. He also wants Joshua to remember not only does God have a plan, but God always supplies the means and the power to achieve his plan. God wanted Israel to take possession of the land that he'd promised to them. And as we make our way uh, into chapter 2, we see two spies who went to view the promised land as a part of this getting ready process which Pastor talked about last week. Israel responds to God in faith and prepares to get ready to move. They discover God was already moving, setting things in order for the time when Israel would enter the land. As the story continues to unfold, we see Joshua getting himself and the people ready to experience God and to cross the Jordan. And for the people of Israel, and for us as well, to see God at work, there's a preparation work that must take place in the life of the child of God. We're going to pick up in Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, and then we'll make our way through the rest of the chapter in a few moments. But it says this, Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and they shed out for Shadam. And they came to Jordan. He and all the people of Israel lodged there before they passed over. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, As soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, your God being carried by the Levitical priest, then you shall set out from your place... And follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it about 2,000 cubits in length. Do not come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go. 
for you have not passed this way before. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass on before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. Finally, after years of waiting, the people of Israel were finally about to cross the Jordan into the land promised to Abraham, the ancestor. This is a major event in Israel's story, seeing the promise given to Abram so long ago. We can see this in Genesis 12, verse 7. It says, to your offspring I will give this land. At last, they're moving into its fulfillment. And church family, we, we must not underestimate the challenge that this river, this river presents to them. This is not a babbling brook. This is not a small creek in which to paddle. It's a fast-flowing, swirling flood, probably between 10 and 12 feet deep at this season and at this point. Walking and swimming are absolutely out of the question. Rafts are an impossibility. And engineering hasn't excavated a passageway as of yet. So this isn't just a small problem. This is a big situation that the people of Israel are facing. And remember, too, this is a whole nation. Wives, children, animals, and baggage. And let's just think about our life for a second. How many of you like to pack for a trip? Raise your hand. Some of you probably do. You just don't want to admit it because you're in the minority. But I don't like to pack for a trip. I don't like to pack for my wife and I. It's just two people. And I will be honest, it's primarily me because I overpack. I don't want to ever come, there be a situation where I'm not prepared. I don't want there to be a change of weather and me not have something to wear, which to some degree that would help because then I could go shopping, so that's another problem in and of itself. But yet, this is a whole nation about to cross the Jordan. With their family, their kids, their animals. And they're on the move with no obvious way to cross the swollen river. But they're on the move because God says move forward. They don't know how it will happen. But they take the next logical step to move forward in obedience. Because God has already said to move. And they trust Him. And they leave the outcome with Him. But even in the face of the river. The wait is over. It's finally coming to pass. Joshua believes in the promise and the power of God. He's followed everything God had told him to do in chapter 1. And now he's making sure everything is in order so the people are able to cross the Jordan and experience God. Joshua believes in who God is. Joshua trusts the promises of God. Joshua has walked with God as he walked with Moses. Joshua knows that God is capable of fulfilling his purpose with Israel. And Joshua is waiting on the word of the Lord with patience and anticipation. Joshua also recognizes for this to happen there were parameters and instructions that had to be followed. Joshua had to had told the people that the Ark of the Covenant, which represents God's very presence, would go before them. It was to be carried by the Levitical priest. The people were to look towards the Ark, not the river. The people would follow it, but they had to keep a distance of 2,000 cubits in length, which is about 1,000 yards between themselves and the Ark. And the emphasis... On this was the sacredness of the ark of God's presence among his people. His presence was among them and it wasn't to be taken lightly. In doing so, the people of Israel would show their respect to God. And then they would be shown in the way they should walk, both physically and spiritually. This imagery is nothing new to the people of Israel. Through the Old Testament, we see God guiding them both physically and spiritually. In Exodus 18, where Jethro is talking to Moses, we see, You shall warn them about the statutes and the laws and make them known the way in which they must walk and what they must do. Deuteronomy 8, 6 says, You shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God by walking in His ways and by fearing Him. 
This imagery that Joshua continues is nothing new. It was a cloud by day and a fire by night. They understand what's at play. They understand what's, what's about to unfold. And Joshua is helping the people show respect to God while allowing them to see God is leading them just like he has in the past and just like he will do in the future. God is going before his people. And once the officers went throughout the camp, Informing the people about what's about to happen, about what's about to go down. Joshua makes one more command. And Joshua says in, in verse 5, he says, Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourself, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. Consecrate, the Lord's going to do wonders among you. Joshua is letting the people know, not only do we need to recognize and know God for who he truly is, we also need to be cleansed. Joshua commands the people to consecrate themselves in view of the wonders that God will do among them on the next day. The people need to sanctify or cleanse themselves. So that they are set apart to experience God. By Joshua doing this, he reminds them and he reminds us that God is holy. We're not. And we too need to be cleansed. The basic idea behind this was that Joshua was saying to separate or abstain from anything unclean that would contaminate one's relationship with a perfect God. This preparation would have included extensive and rigorous ritual for preparation, but it was necessary. And then we see God speak to Joshua. God begins to confirm Joshua's role among, among his people. God tells Joshua in verse 7, Today I'll begin to exalt you in the sight of Israel, that they may know that I was with Moses, so I will be with you. God begins to lift up Joshua. God wanted, Pete, God wanted the people to know he's with them, just like he was in the days of Moses, and more importantly, the living God is among them right then. And then we see Joshua Gather the people of Israel and say, come, hear the words of the Lord your God. We see this unfold. And in verse 8, we begin to see the instructions continue. And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. What does it say, beside or in? In. This wasn't a small river. Remember, this wasn't just a a nice little puddle. It was a river at flood stage. And he says, stand in the Jordan. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, here is how you will know the living God is among you and that he without fail. He's not going to fail. Will drive out before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Can we add another ite in there? <laughs> Thank you. I'll leave that one alone. And he says this Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is passing over before you. Where? Into the Jordan. Now therefore take twelve men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man. And when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. How many times is he trying to emphasize in the Jordan? The waters shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. Joshua affirms what is about to take place. Joshua reminds the people how they will know God is among them. He reminds them how God will drive out all the people who are across the Jordan. He reminds them that God will go before them. And he reminds them the waters will be held back when the priests enter the Jordan. Why? So everyone will know the living God is among you. 
God wanted to make a statement. It wasn't primarily to help get them across the Jordan that was part of the process. But he wanted to know. He wanted them to know. He wanted everybody in that region who he was and what God is capable. He wanted everyone to know that the living God is alive and well. And he knows that there's no difference in today's culture. God still wants you and me and those around us to know that God is alive and well. He wants them to know that. And then we get to verse 14 of, of Joshua chapter 3. And they're about to set out. And it says, so when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant before the people. And as soon as those bearing the Ark had come as far as the Jordan, and the feet of the priests bearing the Ark were dipped in the brink of the water. Now the Jordan overflows all its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down above stood and rose up in a, in a heap very far away at Adam, the city that is beside Jerith, and, and those flowing down the sea of Reb, the salt sea, were completely cut off. And the people passed over opposite Jericho. Now the priests bearing the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firmly on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan. And all of Israel was passing over on dry ground until all the nation finished passing over the Jordan. The time has come. It's time for the people to set out. It's time for the waiting to stop. The, the time for instruction has gone. The time for action has come. And God is about to do a new work through Joshua and the people of Israel. And here we see on this day, the people of Israel and their enemies will know that the living God is among them. The talk is it's over. It's time to act. And as you read this story, I begin to think about the priest. The priest will take their position. You know, they're, they're ahead of the people. About 2,000 cubits. And can you imagine what was going through their mind? Can you imagine that they were about to step into a river that was overflowing, that was beyond its borders? Can you imagine what was going through the, the, the priests' minds as they were about to set out on an adventure that was about to change the course of history? But at the same time, can you just imagine what it would have been like to be a priest? They've seen God work before. But at the same time, they understood for us to cross the river there's got to be one of us guys take a step and step into the river. Can you imagine what was going through their minds? I just would love to understand. I'd love to have a conversation one day in heaven. I'm going to find these guys and be like, hey, what was it like? Who was first? Who was the first one to take a step in? Did y'all cast lots? Did you draw a short straw? How did you become the first one to step in this river? Because, I mean, that's like crazy. But at the same time, God called you, so you've got to act. But, man, like, what was going on? Because here's what you think about when you read this story, is that you could be the very channel, or you could be the very uh, way in which someone else can experience God. It took the priest for the Israelites to experience God in this way, and you too could be the avenue in which someone else experiences God and makes Him known. You could be that very person that helps someone else experience God. Because in this situation, the priests grabbed a hold of the Ark of the Covenant and they will step into the water. And as soon as their foot into the Jordan, the water is held back. And I love what it says. As long as the priests stood firm in the middle of the Jordan, the people were able to cross on dry ground. Not muddy or mushy ground, but dry ground. I'm sure we've all been down some type of dirt road before. And I, as I read this story, I believe that's the same thing happened. It was so dry that it was ticking up a, a cloud of dust. And not only were they seeing the waters being held back, they were seeing the aroma of a dirt road being stirred up because there were millions of people crossing a Jordan River at flood stage on dry ground. All because the living God is among them. As a result of God going before and the people were able to cross the river and occupy the land that God had promised generations and generations before. Through all the preparation, all the hard work, all the waiting, and even all the instruction, it was finally worth it. 
And if we're honest, I'm sure there were, there were times where they would have preferred to, to jump across a small puddle, jump across a small, a small creek. But in doing so, they would have missed out on the greatest gift of all, which is not only experiencing God in the miraculous, but it's also experiencing God in the journey. I guarantee you there's some of y'all right now that wish that there's a season of life that you just wish that you could get through so that you could stop experiencing what's in between. I'm sure there's seasons in your life where you look back and wish that you could have just jumped through a new season. But here's the deal. Like, yeah, you want to experience the miraculous, but if you don't stop and just realize that even from point A to point Z, that's a miracle in and of itself because you're experiencing living God in your day-to-day journey. And I guarantee the people of Israel would love to have jumped that creek, jumped that river. But at the same time, they would have missed out on experiencing God in the everyday process of following Him. Man, could you just imagine, just think about it. As long as the priest stood still, the ground was dry. I mean, could you just imagine what you were going, what, what the people would have experienced going by the priest, knowing that because they're standing there, I'm standing on dry, dry ground. And can you imagine the stories that are told because of that experience? And can you imagine the stories that you can tell of your experience that can change someone else's life, but at the same time, you've got to go through it. You can't just jump to the other side. Joshua led the people across the Jordan on dry ground. And church family, we may not call, be called to lead a large group of people across the raging river at flood stage, but we are called to follow God like Joshua did. And we too can experience who God is and others can see the glory of God. You know, we may not ever lead a group of people that large, but we're all called to follow him. And when we look at our life and we look at the story of Joshua, we can see some very important truths that we can apply to our life today that can help us follow him wholeheartedly. And the first one is this, Joshua focused on God and served him wholeheartedly. And the question that we have to think about when we think about Joshua is what are you looking at? For you, what are you focused on? For Joshua, he told the people, look at the Ark of the Covenant. Focus on that. Don't focus on the river. Don't focus on the problem. Focus on who God is and what God is doing. And for us, a lot of times we get bombarded with what's going on around us, what's going on in the world. And all the while, that's important, but we also need to remain focused on God and serve Him wholeheartedly. Joshua is that perfect example of someone who did that. And the ark was a a symbol of God's presence that led the people. And for us, that is Jesus Christ. He was promised to never to leave us or forsake us. And And it tells us in Hebrews that we're to look to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God. And so for us, we have to look to Jesus just like the people of Israel look to the ark. We too look to Jesus. Joshua looked to God and so should we. And we also can see in Joshua chapter 24 that he, offered, he also challenged the people to decide who they're going to serve. It's a familiar passage that we see on shirts, we see on posters, we see on plaques. And we all know this and we can see that Joshua says, Choose who you're going to serve. Whether the gods of your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And for us, we have to come to the conclusion who we looking at and who we serving. We have to ask ourselves the question, who are we going to look to and serve? What are even, who are the gods or the idols in our life? Are you looking to the world for fulfillment? And do we truly want to make God our priority and serve Him wholeheartedly? Joshua says, hey man, I'm in it. And at the end of the day, as believers in Christ, we should be too. We're able to understand and experience who God is, and we need to serve Him wholeheartedly. Heartedly. Second truth that we can apply to our life from this story is this Joshua, listen to God. 
I don't want to get anybody in trouble, but how many of you have a hard time listening? Anybody? This isn't a good time to hit someone next to you either. But we all have a hard time listening. And Joshua was willing to listen to to what God was saying. He was in a position to hear and receive the word of the Lord. Like He made sure he was able to hear. He got up in the morning. He was in a position where he could receive the word of the Lord and share it to his people. And we have to ask ourselves, are we in a position where we can hear God? We have the Holy Spirit who speaks in and through us. We have God's Word. Are we in a position in our day-to-day life where we can honestly say that I can hear from God? And if not, what needs to change? What needs to change in your life so that you can put all the distractions away? You can put all the the worldly pressures aside and honestly hear God. It may mean that you have to set aside some time. It may mean that you have to reschedule an event. It may mean that you have to, you know, find time to set aside so that you can hear him. You may have to turn off a TV, turn off a cell phone, or go to bed earlier so that you can get up earlier. We need to set aside time so that we can honestly listen and hear. So many times we would rather do the talking instead of the listening. James reminds us everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. So today and this week, what needs to change that you can hear God? What needs to change that you can take some time and just spend some time in His Word and allow God to speak to you and through you? Because a lot of times it's interesting how it happens. We may come to God just honestly desiring to listen and to hear, but a lot of times we become God's instrument Joshua not only listened, but he spoke too. But it's always after we listen to God. And there is no doubt Joshua heard from the Lord. And guess what? We can too if we're simply willing to position ourselves in a posture that will receive the word of the Lord. Thirdly, we can see this. Joshua waited on God. How many of you have a hard time being patient? Anybody? Yeah. If listening isn't hard enough for us, then waiting on God can sometimes be even harder. Not only did Joshua wait several days to cross the river, but it's been years of waiting for Joshua. If you remember his story, uh, which we looked at several weeks ago, Joshua believed in God. Joshua sent out with his buddy who? Who was the other one that he sent out with? Caleb. Joshua and Caleb and the other ten guys went out. And all of a sudden, these two guys believed in God. They believed that God could take them. They believed in the power of God, but the other ten didn't. But because of their faith, God said, hey, you can enter the promised land. So Joshua has not only been waiting a week to experience the promised land, Joshua has waited for generations to die off to experience the, the promised land. Joshua waited on God. He believed that they could take the fortified cities. He believed even though those people that that were in the land were bigger and stronger, they believed that they could do it. And so Joshua is about to experience something he's been waiting on for over 40 years. Joshua focused on God and he served him wholeheartedly. Joshua listened to God. And Joshua waited on God. We too remember, it's not, we need to remember it's not in our time. It's in God's time. God will speak in his time. God will act in his time. We need to be patient and willing to wait and listen. And it's hard. Let's not even, let's just admit that from the forefront. It's hard to listen. It's hard to wait. And in Psalms 27, 14 tells us this, that we should wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Fourth thing that we can see that Joshua did that we can do as well is this. Is Joshua consecrated himself to God. 
Joshua recognized the need to be cleansed and, and to be set apart to be in the presence of God and to be used by God. Joshua understood the importance of making sure his heart was right. Joshua understood the need for the people's heart to be right. Joshua understood this. And yes, our, our sins are paid for. Yes, we are cleansed through His blood. And we can see this in Ephesians 1, 7. It says this, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to His riches of His grace. This isn't a salvation issue. It's a sanctification issue. We are in, be in the process of being sanctified and transformed into His likeness. Joshua understood the need for us to be set apart, to be cleansed on a day-to-day -day basis for us to experience in God, to experience God and to make Him known. And for us as individuals in a church, we need to recognize and understand our sin can impact our relationship with God. Our sin can impact our relationship with others and God's ability to work through us. Yes, we are forgiven. Yes, we are cleansed. But our sin can impact our relationships. And the sin can, in part, impact God's ability to work through us. A challenging passage that is a perfect and unfortunate example of this can be found in Joshua chapter 7. We see Joshua continue to lead the people. We see Joshua continuing to, to go before. But all of a sudden, Achan, in verse 1, we can see, took something that was devoted to the gods of the foreign land. We saw that he, he took it. And what happened is crazy, but, and, it, and it seems so minute and so little, but at the same time, it affects the whole group because in verse 12, it says this, Therefore, the people of Israel could not stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more, says God. And so we can see this. The sin of one impacted the whole group. And for us, we a lot of times, especially in the West, we just think about us and our immediate family. But a lot of times what we need to think about in this culture, if you read this whole chapter, it was more about the group, the people of Israel, than it was just Achan. They understood that the sin of one could impact the whole group. And for us, we need to understand that our sin can impact other people. Our sin can impact the whole body of Christ, not just the small group. And I don't mean to meddle, and I, I promise when I read this text and I got to verse 5, I was like, man, this is hard to think through, hard to process, hard to preach through. But hey, here's what we need to ask the question and think through. Have you ever thought about how the sin in your life could be the very reason God isn't moving in and through you? It's not the fact that you're, it's not a question of salvation. It's not a question of are you cleansed. It's a question of a sanctification, like I said earlier. Have you ever thought about the sin in your life that may be unconfessed, that you may not be willing to, to ask for forgiveness or share? It could be the very reason God is not working in and through you. The sin of Achan impacted a whole group of people. It cost people their life. And I'm not going to go to that, that degree, but at the, we, can, we have to realize and, and at least look at the fact that it's true. There are implications to it. Have you ever thought for that your sin and my sin could be the very reason God isn't moving more in our church? The sin of Achan impacted not just him and his family, but it impacted the whole group. And I can't get past where it says, God, I will be with you no more. For us, we need to cleanse ourselves. Just like Joshua expected the people to be cleansed and be set apart so that they could experience God and make him known, the same needs to be happening in our life. We need to recognize who God is and we need to cry out to him. Just like the, the words of David in Psalms 139 and the words of John in 1 John 1, 9 where it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David's pleading with God. David's recognizing who he is as a person and he's being willing to position himself and saying, God, search me. And we too need to have that same desire. God, search me and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. 
we see that in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, He is faithful. He's faithful. And just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Joshua set the standard. It was to be set apart and the standard's still there because you can read in 1 Peter, it tells us to be holy in all of our conduct because that's who we are as Christians. We're set apart and Joshua set that standard. He knew he needed to be cleansed. He knew the people of God needed to be cleansed and we too on a daily basis, needed to approach him and say, God, search me and know my heart. All the while knowing that our sins are already taken care of. Our sins are nailed to the cross and separated as far as the east is from the west. They're forgotten. But it's a constant continuation of being sanctified in his image. Lastly, Joshua obeyed. After all this time of waiting, after all this time of hearing God and experiencing God alongside Moses, after all this time of hearing about what God's going to do, hey, I've heard this story my whole life, and now Joshua, it's time to act. When, When it was time, Joshua obeyed. In the face of the greatest adversity up to this point in trial, he was obedient. He led the people across the Jordan. And church family, it's time for us to step into the water too. I don't know what he's calling you to do. I don't know what he's doing in your life. But at the same time, it's time for us to act just like Joshua. No matter what comes our way, no matter what we're about to face, we too need to take a step of faith and step into the water. Because just like Joshua, God went before them and God goes before us. God will never left them and God will never leave you and God will never leave me. What he requires from us is submissive obedience that desires his glory rather than our own and is content to fulfill whatever role he is pleased to assign us to. Joshua was was to lead the people. And for us, it most likely will be a different calling. But no matter what it is and no matter what he calls us to, let us be obedient to him at all costs. It's amazing what God can do with people who will listen, who will wait upon the Lord and set themselves apart and be willing to obey. It's amazing what could happen. And church family, I truly believe God wants to use us and and desires us to experience more of who he is, but it will not happen if we're unwilling to prepare ourselves both individually and corporately. And let us be a group of people who are willing to look to God and do whatever it takes to experience God And make his glory known. I can promise you this. All the preparation and the heartache it took to plan our wedding was worth every minute. One of my favorite pictures is this one right here. It was as we walked out of here. And we got to experience everything that we've prayed for and planned for. And a lot of y'all made that happen. We'll be forever grateful. And then my second favorite one is this. Is that one right there. But here's the truth. I I couldn't experience that with all the preparation. And more importantly, our journey with God may not be easy. It may be hard. But experiencing him for who he truly is and making him known will always be worth it. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to come and worship you this morning and to grow in our faith and learn from stories like Joshua, how you faithfully worked on behalf of the people and you led them. You never left them. You were, you were there the entire time. God, let this story impact our life and let us be willing to just be set apart so that other people can know you and we can experience you for who you truly are. And God, let us never lose sight of the words of David in Psalms 139 and John in 1 John 1, 9. Let us ask God to to search us and, and to reveal to us our brokenness. And let us draw near to you because you say if we draw near to you, you'll draw near to us and confess us so that we can be set apart for your glory. And God, if there's anybody here today that does not have a personal relationship with you, 
Let today be the day of their salvation. And these things we ask and pray in your precious and holy name.